This is your opportunity to tease open which way the pendulum is swinging. And I know you're all dying to put your hands up. But let's see, <laughs> let's see who's first. Now, I'm going to ask our question runner to come and get the microphone, and then we'll have our first question. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Altaf Malik, uh, Arabs, uh, Senior Projects. Um, first, I'd like to respond to Ruth uh, about um, surgeons. Um, I mean, my, uh, or our view is that surgeons have the luxury of bearing their mistakes. Us engineers, we quite often have to live with ours. So <laughs> that's uh, my response to that. Um, <laughs> secondly, um, getting on to resilience now. Um, <laughs> um, on, on the resilience, surely it's a luxury that is only afforded to the richer nations where you have the, uh, the opportunity for planning resources. And really, shouldn't we be focusing on resilience, on rebuilding the third world economies, which actually would be a greater economic benefit because if there is the shock that occurs on those, then there's less pressure on the developed world in having to finance and rebuild that particular issue. That's all. So, uh, uh, luxury, Could, uh, uh, would anyone like to put their hands up if they've got something to say about that? Ruth. So, I just want to say, um, I, I completely agree about um, resilience but resilience is not a luxury, resilience is a necessity. And, and I had the privilege of chairing the first um, International Engineers, Frontiers of Engineering um, workshop between engineers from the developing world and, and, and not just engineers, but also um, businesses in the developing world and sharing resilience practice across a whole variety of systems like electricity systems, water systems, etc. And it was very obvious, 60 people in the room from about 30 different countries, it's very obvious that the most resilient solutions are being implemented in developing countries. And, and that it's not, um, it's not a West teaching the East, it's the East teaching the West. And that, that is the flow of knowledge that happened in the room that day. It's the, the systems that we have built, and I'll repeat it, by engineers, <laughs> that have made us less resilient in, in, in our so-called developing economies, in our so-called developed economies, and it's the developing economies that are, are actually thinking through what happens in terms of failure when systems fail. And, and so I, I agree with you. Um, but it shouldn't be seen as an East-West debate. Oh, Trevor, what's your perspective? Oh, can we have a round of applause for that, please? <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm missing my duties. Trevor, I can see you're burning to grasp the mic. Burn, burning, thank you. Uh, uh, and, and I really appreciate the question, but I think there's a, a different perspective on resilience. It doesn't have to be just for the rich and prosperous. Good resilience, smart resilience, can actually be the most economically financial set of solutions for a whole range of situations. So if, for example, you look at a city which has uh, issues with, let's say, uh, power and energy security, water security, flood risk, etc., it might be the interconnectivity of the water and wastewater system can actually mitigate risks against a whole range. So rather than dealing with risks in isolation and paying time and again for different sets of mitigations, Good resilience could actually be far more beneficial, and certainly if you take into account the environmental and societal benefits of resilience on top of that. And that's why we need to get smarter at economics, to understand those full costs and understand the real benefit of resilience, not risk management, which is where we've all too often been. Uh, and if you're starting from scratch, it's relatively straightforward. If you're working backwards, it, it's not. But rather than just incrementally mitigating risk after risk in isolation, you, if you can start thinking about where the interconnectivities and dependencies are, it could lead to a more efficient set of solutions. Sorry, long sentence. So thank you, Trevor. I, I'm, I'm, I've got moderator's discretion, so as a hand's been up, I'm going to share this. I, um, I just want to point attention to the fact that Trevor really needs to join our team because if you read the motion, you're, you're saying that resilience, your team is saying resilience doesn't hold value. You're arguing that it does, which is what we're arguing. So welcome to, welcome to team A1. <laughs> so, uh, can we have a round of applause? This is far more, it should be far more interactive than it is. Uh, I'm going to take... Um, um, 
Fred on my right, and then we're going to open up for an, another question. I, I just think the, the gentleman's point is, is very well founded. Resilience, investment in resilience building is a luxury afforded to richer nations. There's no evidence of a willingness to pay by vulnerable developing nations or in vulnerable de developing nations and resilience. The evidence is plain. Thank you. Oh, well, the evidence is plain. So, um, <laughs> so our next point, I'm sure, um, I, I'm not sure which hand, the gentleman at the front, could you please uh, just let us know who you are, please? Hello, I'm uh, Toby Harris. I'm a member of the House of Lords. Uh, and therefore, in some senses, I'm a recovering politician. But I also act as the uh, UK coordinator of the Electric Infrastructure Security Council. I think what is missing from the discussion that we've had tonight is any comment on whether decision-making per se works. And there's been some occasional mentions of it that uh, too many decisions are taken on a short-term basis, whereas the reality of building a long-term resilient society or community is that this is a long-term investment and therefore an electoral cycle of three years, four years, five years or whatever else it might be militates against that. Now that could of course be an argument for you know, life dictatorship or something like that and the, some, somebody with uh, uh, the appropriate vision. But that also brings us to the, brings the, the second question about whether decision making works, which is whether it is making decisions on behalf of a narrow section of society or all of society. Now that might simply be that it's making decisions in, in uh, favour of an elite or it might simply be that it's making decisions in favour of a narrow majority, because if you have a narrow majority and you're in a democracy, you can get re-elected. But it's those fundamental flaws which make it more difficult to take long-term decisions about resilience, which are going to benefit the whole community uh, over a time frame which is beyond that uh, horizon of elections. Uh, so I think that's an excellent question and something that's been discussed over the last couple of days, so I think you're in the right space. Uh, I don't see any hands shooting up. Did you? Did you? I, sorry. No, well, I clearly didn't see them. Has a hand shot up on this side? Yeah. And has one gone up on this side? So given that last time we gave you the... Um, Trevor? Go on, Juliet. This time we're only going to take one response from each side. I'm just getting into the swing of the debating because now I'm debating with a politician, which is as brave as it gets. Um, recovering politician. So I think Toby's point was excellently made and I think it supports what we're trying to say that currently the value of resilience isn't real because it's not the thing that decisions are made on and that's what needs to change before decision making changes, before resilience starts to be implemented in day to day practice. So thank you, Toby. I'm not sure you were Thank you, Juliet. Can we have a round of applause, please? <laughs> and um, so, uh, Kaylee, um, keep it succinct, if possible. Thank you. Um, see, I would argue that your point supports our side because I think that resilience is certainly can help decision makers, but the point is it isn't just for decision makers. Resilience takes into account that the whole of society is involved in working towards a stronger future. I think you have to have decision makers on your side. They have to be supporting resilience, embedding it in the way that a, a government runs. But it also recognises that it's not just about what government does. It's about what NGOs are doing, what citizens are doing. And we saw that in the drought in Cape Town and we certainly wouldn't have succeeded were it not for the role of citizens and their, their resilience. Um, and that's important. So in interesting. Interesting at a time of climate change where we have this incremental change and we have these shocks that we're talking about this. So thank you very much for bringing that in. Very relevant. I think we had another question from a gentleman in the middle. Thank you very much. My name is um, Peter Ayola. I'm a vacation student in Arab. I, I was able to lay my hands on a report that was done in February this year in London called the, the London Black Sky Seminar. 
2018. My, I'm doing my master's now in UCL. So my supervisor, Professor Brian Collins, chaired, um, was, he was in that discussion. And they discussed black sky hazards, how, you know, infrastructures and societal resilience to black sky hazards. And on, on Tuesday, in Metro, page 11, I'm, I'm, I'm with it here. It was said that at, at Gatwick Airport, there was a serious failure, power failure, in which over 100 people missed their flight. And I have a report here that there's even a comic here that said that you got to be kidding. And this is the first time this is happening in... Exactly. And there are, there are a lot of things there. Um, such that people cannot even see their time of flight. They can't. There's no travel information. Nothing. A lot of people were just crying. People, money and other stuff. Um, then I, because I am I'm from Nigeria, and I, if this could happen, even in developed country, then it is high time we take resilience issues seriously. Talking about infrastructures. So um, my question is, as Sorry, I'm, an, um, I'm a student engineer, and I have a lot of things here because I wanted to make some comment about what Ruth said, talking about um, we engineers, we are arrogant and blah, blah, blah. But I have, I have some reservations on that anyway. <laughs> and, and now, my question is, we now, we have tools, we have reasons to to convince the decision makers as engineers to take the matters of resilience seriously. There are a lot of quotations that I have here because time will not permit me talking about black hazard failure, which will probably be happening if we don't take this resilience issue seriously. So now my question is, the decision makers, um, someone was saying the decision makers is not only the decision makers, it's a whole side of thing, which is very true. But the decision makers plays a major role in matters of resilience. And, and as such, it is high time, even we as engineers, we need to give them, show them things to make resilience goals urgent. That is just my comment. Thank you very much. So thank you for your contribution and very uh, up to date. Uh, immediate, Ruth. So I, I would just like to take the opportunity of introducing you to Toby. <laughs> because the thing that you're talking about is, is exactly the thing that Toby is campaigning for. And, and it's a very timely intervention because tomorrow is an exercise, a global exercise. Is it tomorrow or today? today. It's, okay, it's a 24 hour clock. Depends which part of the world you do it. You can catch it tomorrow. It's a global exercise and it's called EarthX. And it's where organizations and individuals sign up to understand what you would do in the event of a black sky hazard. How would your organization survive? And is it 9,000 global corporations have signed up to take part in this exercise? So, that, so the question, so, so you're, what, what you're raising there about how does Gatwick survive? How does Tesco survive? How will Google survive? All these companies are investing at least intellectually, in exploring that problem for themselves. And there's a, there's a whole module there in that exercise, which is for individuals and families to understand how will you and your family get through the next three weeks without electricity, and therefore water, and therefore phone, and therefore transport, and therefore everything else that depends on it. So in favor of our side, against the motion, that investment is taking place, and people are caring about it enough to sign up to events like this, because they see it as real and present threats and things which, it's not if they happen, they will definitely happen. Uh, and people are investing it right now. And that's why it's our side of the debate. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. It's getting passionate. So, Julia, maybe you'd have an opportunity to I'm pass a comment. I'm loving the debate. Here. <laughs> Just give me the microphone. <laughs> You'll be on the I will. Yeah. Um, just coming back to the motion about if the value of resilience is real, I would argue that 100 passengers missing their flights on holiday is not sufficient evidence of the value of resilience. That was it. Oh. 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 Well, we've, we've got about five or six of them in the room at the moment. So <laughs> at the moment. Uh, the hand at the back went up first, so could you uh, pass it over there, please? 
Thank you. So I completely agree with that. And I think for me, that's what makes that the statement that you're supporting uh, clear is I think, you know, I, I've seen the experience, for example, of uh, rail systems saying, what is the acceptance failure that we can cope with? Right. You know, I live in Holland and there when, you know, it doesn't snow a lot and all that. So they said investing in warming up the switches is going to cost this amount, which is going to increase the cost of the travel this amount. It snows maybe twice, three times in a year in Holland. We can live with those three days pulling buses. And so for them, the cost benefit, right, the, the valuation didn't drive you know, an investment there or another solution. However, the cost of me being the passenger that day, sleeping in a terminal, not going or, you know, taking three, three buses to, to cross that, it was huge. So it's relative. The value is a relative thing to who values it. So the moment decision making is sitting on the rail company or rail regulator or rail budget organization, it's going to be relative to there situation and it's not going to be relative to my individual situation if i'm the one making the decision just bloody put all the money into that thing because i want to get home right so i think th for me the statement is right it's just that i would say that it needs the word capture on it is like if we will be able to capture the economic and the resilience value we will be doing it already because we are not able to capture it because of its relative situation. So I, the, the rail industry or rail budget organization doesn't see capture my, <laughs> my happiness, my tweets saying, yay, you know? So until they don't capture that, they don't value it in their decision making. So I think that's what's made complex and that's why the statement. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to make a couple of distinctions, uh, maybe that that uh, place me uh, closer to where Mark is sitting rather than uh, to either side. Um, one is uh, who 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 are the decision makers that we're talking about, and I'd like to distinguish between the the kind of uh, uh, the public facing decision makers that they often are on on uh, political uh, cycles. Uh, versus the kind of standing bureaucracy of often very technical decision makers. Um, and they make very different kinds of uh, risk analyses. Uh, and often the technical decision makers are the ones that are, are really responsible for the kind of day-to-day -day management. They, they, uh, they're the ones that are much more involved in actually thinking about risk and thinking about resilience. And they're often, in, in my experience, uh, the, they actually are trying to really grapple with these issues in a conditional way. So the public-facing politician is often kind of responding uh, to what is heard from, from underneath. The other part of that is what, what are the types of risks that we're seeing? And, uh, and I would say that, that there are, uh, in, in my, my vision, I'm a, I'm a biologist, an aquatic biologist, but I, I feel like I, I li have to live in the world uh, of uh, of engineers and economists, so I have to learn to speak their language, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, I, you know, I, I I see I see resilience as having two primary components, uh, and one is robustness. How do you develop a comprehensive solution based on relatively known risks? And then there's the the deep uncertainty, the stuff that's really hard to be able to uh, quantify. And, and, uh, and estimate and, and be able to predict. And often that's a huge basket of uh, potential events. And that's where flexibility is actually a really critical uh, component of resilience. And I would say that we're getting pretty good with the robustness part of resilience. We're, we're thinking in a much more systematic way, especially that kind of technical decision maker, that they're doing a good job and making uh, progress against the goal there. But it's the flexibility part uh, and, the, and the deep uncertainty that represents the real challenge for us. And that's where I would say is uh, probably the middle spot uh, uh, between the two sides. So we're going to just take an immediate response. Just one person on each side to this response. Um, 
Diego. I, I was totally confused. I don't know if I, I should be still role playing or I can answer <laughs> more uh, sort of uh, from a try to provide a re an answer from our experience. But because I, I wanted to address a couple of things. I, I mean, following what John was saying, but I think the struggle that we have, at least in, in the bank, no? when we help uh, developing countries, is on the decision making process. Uh, and and I, I can give you a couple of interesting examples. I mean, you, you are, I, I am based in Mexico now, Mexico City, 23 million people, one water utility. Uh, that person is there usually for one administration, so six years. Um, you can imagine in a budget constrained environment what the director of that utility faces on a daily basis, right? So if you talk to him about long term planning, he goes, My long term planning is in an hour from now. Something will happen in the city. Um, and the other case is water utilities outside of Mexico. Up until recently, the director of a water utility could only be in, uh, in service for three years, no re election, right? Uh, on average, they are, they are in the post 1.7 years. So, what can you do in terms of changing the decision making process to ensure that the long term vision is there? No? And a lot of, a lot of it is, is on, on, uh, in a sense, coming up with the tools and incentives where you can show long-term planning but with very short uh, actions, right? What, what is that we can do now uh, in the next six months? But we can propose a vision for 30 years, right? But the, the politician gains on, the, on that, uh, you know, very short-term action. And that's how been, we've been approaching it all over the world. And then we bring the tools. So, you know, what John was saying, I mean, we are now, and, and that's the other uh, aspect of learning a lot from the, the developing countries, right? We started working on uncertainty 10 years ago and helping a lot of these planning frameworks and prioritization investments looking at uncertainty. We, sh we don't lo no longer talk about risks. We, no we don't talk about scenarios. We talk about plausible futures and we can run thousands of plausible futures and we bring the robustness discussion, right? How much of that um, risk or, or, or what is your regret that you're willing to, to accept, no? So, so I think there's a lot of, uh, of, of issues on, on the decision making. What is, it? Fred, what, what is, what is the problem, Bolt? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, but I'll stop there. But. I, think it's a, I think it's a fair point, Matt. Well made. <clears throat> and it, it's clearly resonated with some of the audience there. Yeah, yeah. No. Fred? Diego, my, my dear friend Diego, thank you. That was a, a really nice uh, World Bank promotional campaign, clearly intended to save your job after the preposterous statements you made earlier. I, I'd like to pick up the, I'd like to pick up the, 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 the terrific comments and, and truly the visionary comments of the young gentleman uh, pursuing his master's degree. And sir, you are the progressive, visionary type of guardian of the future that we need, managing our society in the future. Indeed, it is high time to take resi resilience seriously. And with that, we wholeheartedly agree. We're not, we're not contesting the notion of resilience as the right societal path. Or rather, what we're contesting is that the current economic calculus, which reveals, which is revealed in the behavior of decision maker, indicates that there is no real economic value attributed to resilience presently that we're not willing to incur the costs of building resilience for future generations because it is counter to the economic model that we follow. To Marcella's very good point, uh, two very good points. One, there's a need to better articulate the motion, and I think that Trevor has worked magic in demonstrating why the motion in itself is inconsistent. However, to your more important point, <laughs> personal value the personal value of cost to someone waiting in a bus station, delayed in the airport, etc., does not translate to societal value, which is revealed in the behavior of our whole of society and not in individuals. Thanks, Fred.
So thank you for keeping it very concise. I'm going to take a question, a question here and a question there. Could you could we keep them quite sort of pithy and concise if possible, please? And then we might get a few more questions in. Okay? So we'll take two. Thank you. Hi, um, Matthew Ailey, Arup. So um, this is further team in favour of the motion. And um, it just seems to me that your argument implies that economic incentives drive investment in resilience. But does investment in resilience not drive economic prosperity? Does it not guarantee a level of stability in performance that consequently would guarantee a level of stability in economic return or performance? So it comes down to me, you know, the fundamental question of with resilience, stability, without resilience, volatility. And for what part of the economy and for how much of the economy is future volatility actually beneficial? Hi, Catherine Farr, I'm a Venturi Associate. And I'm, I'm looking for some clarification for the A1 Plus team because if I'm honest, it feels a bit schizophrenic between um, what Trevor's saying, which makes sense to me, uh, and Fred, so I'm just giving you a chance, Fred, to like maybe change your mind. Um, to, uh, so, so what I'm hearing from Fred is there's absolutely no economic value. And what I'm hearing from Trezor, Trevor is Resilience has value, that's why we've been doing it, that's why the statement is true. So a little bit of a difference there in how uh, the pro team is interpreting uh, that, and I would like to see a more coherent explanation. Um, and maybe one, uh, maybe one uh, question about that, um, maybe possibly to both teams. How are you interpreting uh, the group that's making the choice here? So. Uh, are we looking at early adapters? Both teams have given examples of resilience occurring, um, possibly for economic reasons. Um, Henry Ford did not give his workers an eight-hour workday because he thought that would be nice for them to get home to their families. He did it because they did not, uh, they were not productive after that, and there was a huge concern about accidents in the factories. Uh, he was the first. It took a while for everyone else to catch on that that was a good idea. So that's what I'm not quite clear on is, uh, are you guys arguing that there are early adapters and it's not caught on yet? Or uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, thank you for a very insightful question, I think. <laughs> you, you're absolutely right. We agree fundamentally that this motion is right and support it, but we actually agree on that for slightly different reasons, or actually some quite fundamentally different reasons. And I don't think that's a problem. I think that diversity of view is actually quite healthy. And I say that because we're at a really transitional and important stage in understanding that shift from where resilience has been in the past to where it needs to go in the future. For many of the reasons that you know both Juliet Fred and I have articulated, so particularly with Fred talking about the inconsistencies and inability of the economic process to make a compelling case for decision makers. For me to say yes, that's absolutely the case in some situations, but there are really significant rays of hope and light where people are making great progress that we should be recognising and that we should be celebrating and supporting them so that they can do more of that good work in the future and others can learn from it. So that's why we agree for slightly different reasons in my view. Another question, which is about current stability or future volatility. Do we still respond? Yeah, go on. And then I'll pass it over here. Okay, very good. Well, let me see if I can, can address both questions. And, 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 and Trevor, masterful understanding of the art of, uh, of, of rhetorical argument, intends to demonstrate the lack of integrity of the, of the motion that we're, that, that we're arguing. I, however, in my response, um, have, have made slight corrections to the argument in order to get to the heart, heart of the matter, which is does uh, behavior, revealed behavior by decision makers reveal that there is an economic and societal value to resilience? And clearly it has not. We're not arguing that there is no economic value. We're, we're, we're arguing rather that this is not revealed by its implementation and investment in practice. Thank you.
And in the principles of fairness, I'd like to pass it over. Um, so, excellent questions from the floor. Clearly we have support, and I agree. I think massive schizophrenia happening to my, to my right. I think something that I wanted to talk to you was Fred's continuing point about no economic impact. And I think I have two examples from Cape Town, one of which speaks to some previous discussion. It, the first, in the, in the case of the drought, the economic value of businesses and households having personal resilience with rainwater catchments, ensuring that they can cont continue their business throughout the drought, not only helped the city as a whole to get through because it cut down consumption, but it allowed for business continuity, which has clear economic value. And similarly, with rolling blackouts, this is something that we experienced in South Africa two years ago. It was something that was a reality for us. So while other people might be you know, role-playing this in the developing world, <laughs> we have lots of examples of this happening, and we've survived through it, and we've become stronger, and that's the point about resilience. And so to the gentleman at the front's question originally, I think that this is not about the developed world having to support the developing world. I think that the, the idea of interconnectedness and resilience is that we can both share and learn from each other. And I think something like the 100 Resilient Cities Network is exactly speaking to that. It's about the fact that we can share resilience knowledge and we can all learn and be stronger together for our entire world system. <laughs> So um, we're, I'm going to take one more question. <laughs> I'm going to take one more question, and then, and then after we've had that response, you'll each get an opportunity to give us literally one line. Right? You, I want you to think really hard about you know why you guys, why your team. Right? One line each. Um, so. The last question will come from this young lady over here on the left, who's had a hand up for hours. Uh, so, hang on. Um, okay, so my question is a bit critical towards you, I feel bad, because you championed my question. But um, I think, in principle, uh, decision makers think they're investing in resilience, but fundamentally decision makers are implementing systems that are regulatory and lack the flexibility needed for resilience. So if we were to look at Brexit that you brought up as a point, if we see that as a shock or a stress, the reaction of the EU to deal with that is to put a two-year limit on dealing with that stress. That does not offer flexibility into the system. So I would argue that decision makers fully recognise the economic and societal value that resilience brings, but I would argue that they're not implementing resilience in what it means. They're building back, but they're not building back better in most situations. That's an excellent question. Thank you very much. And who would like to take that question first? Fred? Uh, just briefly, that's, that's a brilliant comment, and I think it, it fully substantiates our position. They're building back, but they're not building back better, revealing an unwillingness to adopt resilience because it's not reflecting an economic value that decision makers appreciate. Are you a plant? <laughs> no, okay. And, and, and uh, to my left? We're going to duet this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think your point is well made that, that the quality of decision making isn't always as you would want it to be. That doesn't mean that resilience is not a factor in that decision making, it's just that, the, that in, not in all decisions are, res, is, are the right tools there to think about resilience. But I would argue that it is an underpinning long term um, driver in nearly all decisions at all levels. There are just some bad decisions. Um, and to just two finger on that, that's, that's the point of embedding resilience and being part of these networks because not all decision makers understand how to use resilience to affect better decisions. So we see bad decisions and we see the outcomes of those, but we do see decision makers using resilience principles to make better decisions and we need to see more of that. And I think that's our role as practitioners in, in the resilience field is to convince more and more decision makers of the value of resilience. The fact that some don't do it doesn't mean it doesn't hold value. Thank you. So we're now going to introduce a slight little bit of change to what I re just said. 
I'd like you to confer between the three of you and decide who is going to give your one-line response on behalf of your team, okay? So if you can do that, I'm just going to give you 20 seconds, <laughs> 20 seconds each just to confer, okay? I'd just like to, whilst, whilst we're doing that, I'd like to thank everyone for their questions. They were uh, informed by clearly uh, a passion, an understanding and appreciation of the importance of this issue, which is why we're having the debate. So I really value uh, where people are coming from and what they've had to say. I think it's been, I think we've had a great breadth of questioning to challenge our respective teams. So could we have a round of applause for all questioners, please? And again, in the principles of fairness, in, this, in these hallowed halls, would you like to call? Would you like to call? Okay, this gives you an opportunity to go first. I, I think you cheated there. <laughs> um, I think we spoke about the schizophrenia. I think that the, the team on my right have proved our, our arguments, and that is that resilience clearly does have value. There's economic and social value in resilience. And something that's really important, I think, to remember in, in closing is that there's no successful organization that hasn't been resilient. And in the face of ongoing shocks and stresses, we need to continue to build resilience and see more decision makers implementing resilience um, as we spread knowledge about, about the concept and the tools and the value. Thank you. Very concise, very articulate. Fred? Thank you. Our esteemed uh, colleagues to my left, great appreciation for your motions and, and for a, a rigorous debate. Uh, regretting your personal attacks. Uh, <laughs> nonetheless, we appreciate your vision and your aspiration. However, aspiration does not equate with evidence. Uh, and, and there is no evidence that decision makers are willing to incur the costs of moving beyond diagnosing and designing the impacts of resilience to actually building resilience in action. They're willing to build back as the young, young woman eloquently said over here, but they're not demonstrating the willingness to, to build back better, perhaps demonstrating a failure of our economic model, but revealing the real value of resilience to decision makers presently. Ruth uh, also mentioned Trumps it and Brexit, and Trumps it and Brexit uh, are profit maximizing behaviors to maximize economic gain that denigrate resilience and conclusively demonstrate the validity of this motion. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if we were mixing our metaphors there, but they were they, they're pretty convincing arguments for me. I'm not sure whether I'm going this way You're not allowed to go either or way. that way. No, I, I'm in the middle. But I've, been, I've, fe I've felt swayed in both directions. I've been the intellect, the arguments, the evidence. So it's for you to decide. So, um, could we have those people who are voting for the team on my left, the A1 team, please? <laughs> Hands up. <laughs> One, two, hang on, wait. Okay, okay, and... <laughs> well played, well played. And the team to my right. So I've got to say thank you very much. I really appreciate your your consideration. So um, I think the pendulum has swung to the right. Although the majority of the room are to my left. So in the, in the true principles of debating, we're all winners. So, so I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your patience. 
Please enjoy the refreshments afterwards and let's have a round of applause for everybody involved. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>